Welcome everybody to Freelance Writing Direct. I'm your host, Estella Rasmus, the author of Writing That Gets Noticed, Find Your Voice, Become a Better Storyteller, Get Published, and it is now a course at NYU and an elective towards the journalism certificate. Every week I speak with novelists, with authors, with writers of every niche to talk about their tips, their tricks, their strategies, and how the sauce is made, including creative advice. I'll talk about essays and articles and share my own experience from three decades of publishing. So join me every week and grow your business and build your craft with Freelance Writing Direct. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. And follow along on Substack, where I share special clips for subscribers only at estellesrasmus.substack.com. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Freelance Writing Direct. And I am so happy to have Bill Knauer with us today. And I want to tell you a little bit about Bill. So he is the author of Everyone Has What It Takes, A Writer's Guide to the End of Self-Doubt, which I'm holding up right here for my YouTube followers. And he is also the author for Fearless Writing, How to Create Boldly and Write with Confidence, and also Write Within Yourself, an author's companion. And he's the editor-in-chief of Author Magazine. In addition to his books, he's been published in the New York Times, Writer's Digest, Edible Seattle, Parent Map, and has been a featured blogger for the Huffington Post. He also hosts the popular podcast, Author to Author, and Fearless Writing with Bill Knauer. You can find him at W-I-L-L-I-A-M-K-E-N-O-W-E-R.com, and I'll put that all in the show notes. Bill, it's so great to have you. Yes, Del. Yes, I had the pleasure of having you on Author to Author, and you were fabulous, and I am so glad to be on your show. Thank you so much. I loved being on your podcast, Author to Author, and I was also on your site with an extra right. from right. my book. Yeah, that's all about right. finding your voice. So thank you so much for that and for all you do for writers. So yeah. I want to dive right into yeah. this wonderful book. Yeah. Everyone has what it takes. So you go through the perspective of how a writer should think about themselves. You frame your book around your son Jack's diagnosis on the autism spectrum right, and right. say, and I'm going to quote you, <laughs> I learned that the only way I could parent him was if I didn't see him as broken and try to fix him. I couldn't become transfixed by his odd behavior. I had to see beyond that veil to the whole person who lay beneath it. Except it was impossible for me to see him as whole, this kid who hummed and thumped on his chest when he was nervous, if I saw myself as broken because I wasn't successful, or if I saw someone else as broken because they were unkind. The only way I could see Jack as unbroken was if no one was broken, period. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is your mission. This is yeah. a lot of why you also wrote fearless writing yeah. can you unpack that as yeah. your whole philosophy on writers and writing you know it, it's, it was such a powerful moment when i found that language i remember the very day it happened we had taken jack to this school for kids on the spec we didn't end up going there but there was a wonderful woman who ran it and she described her son who had had sensory issues and would literally bang his head against walls because of this and they're going to see a doctor who said oh i can work with him this is not a thing and the kid had turned to her and said oh so i'm not broken she told this story and i was so moved by it and i came home and i was by myself like telling it to myself what just i just heard like a like a kid hearing a, a children's book at night over and over again and then i heard the words but no one is broken I thought, no one is broken. That's it. That's it. That's the only way to see him. That's the only way to see anybody. I got so excited about it. I was so, because I realized that thought of broken people just permeates. It's such a constant within us. And we we frame it in all different ways in terms of failure or cruelty or 
disease or handicaps or whatever it is. We have that belief. I, I was already talking to writers and I started telling stories about Jack to the writers because I understood, and I talk about some in the book, that the broken writer is the writer who doesn't have what it takes. The broken writer is the one who doesn't have the talent, doesn't have the intelligence, the creativity, whatever they think it is, right? And if you don't have it, you can't do it, right? If you don't have it, that elusive whatever it is, you can't do it. And so, so many writers, I understood for myself, because I had not had a lot of success. I thought, maybe I don't have it. I thought, but I do, but I don't, but I do. Where's the, where's the evidence? Where's the proof? Writers would come to these conferences and that question hovered in the room. And I eventually had to accept that the only way to answer that is that everyone has what it takes. Everyone's good enough. Because for writers, the idea that you don't have talent, you don't have the creativity, you don't have it, whatever it is that allows you to succeed, because success hovers around the writing experience, you know, it's the elephant in the room. How do you know? How do you know if you have it? Because you've published? <sighs> Because you've been on the bestseller list. Well, what about the next one? I mean, it never really ends, right? And right. particularly if you haven't, if you're struggling. And I know a lot of writers or just beginning and submitting your stuff and people are saying no and blah, blah, blah. And I thought the only way to know I have what it takes is if everyone does. The only way to know I'm not broken is if no one is. It's the only way to answer the question. And so how do you rest in that? Because I, I go on to describe how you have to kind of rest in that understanding and then speak from it, look from it, interact from it, and never assume, because the thing about, this is interesting, but the thing about brokenness is it ends learning. It says, it's the end of learning. I'm not going to learn about the person. We're just going to try and put a pill into their mouth. We're just going to put a cat. We're just going to fix them. But without brokenness, there's learning. Okay, I didn't sell, but let, what, why aren't I selling? Do I like the book? Have I finished it? Is it what I want? Is it my voice? Let me learn. But if you're broken, there's nothing to learn. And so it ends learning and, and life for writers, for humans is about learning. And so I just got rid of the idea of brokenness and practice seeing people without it. And it was the best, you know, if I die and they put that on my grave, I'm just fine. That <laughs> Bill thought no one was broken. It really answered so much for me. You have an openness to your energy, oh, which you. I think is really a big part of your mission of showing people that nobody is broken, framed around your own experience. And I think that people, if they feel that there's something wrong with them, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. I yes. can't do it's almost that, like a little engine who could. That's I mean, right. there is such wisdom in that old childhood book. Absolutely. And in fact, think about this from writing. So have you ever reached the end of a sentence and you're not sure what comes next? Like you, or you, you have the first idea and you go, no. Nah. And then you get another, and you go, no. And then there, there you are with that blinking cursor and you don't know what comes next. And what, and that I work with clients one-on-one -on -one, and I work some of it's craft stuff, but a lot of it's the psychological part of it. And that moment I've come to learn of, you don't know what comes next. The idea hasn't come yet. That kind of is one of those make or break moments for the writer. You have to know what to do with that moment. And the one thing you can't do is think, I can't do it. Because if you think I can't do it, the answer will not come for as long as you think I can't. And then what will happen, of course, and you know this, you've been through it, you're washing your hair, you're doing the dishes, you're and then, oh, oh, right, there it is. Because you, you've stopped doubting, you've stopped, uh, and then the answer, it comes. Yes. But as a writer, you aren't allowed to doubt you can write the story if you want to write the story. Despite all the evidence that you're not or you haven't found it, you have to trust it will come, even when it hasn't. I think that is so true because... I feel like sometimes if I get blocked, if I'm writing an essay, yeah. I'll watch bad reality <laughs> television <laughs> right, right, and just dive into someone else's problems. And then it's kind of like your brain is still always working. So don't think that your brain turns off just because, but now what you don't want to be saying is I'm never going to do this because no. I sort of believe the universe is like a computer, a giant non-judgmental computer. And if you say, I'm never going to do it, the universe will be like, no, okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that's a big part of what you're 
trying to get to get yeah. people to break through the fear, break through the doubt, and just believe that they can do it, give them the tools, whether self-esteem or ways to look at the world like you do, and like Jack helps you frame, that yeah, helps very other people. And yeah. by the way, in your book, you have an incident where you met Henry Winkler. Right. And it was really your perspective on how you look at the world that allowed you to not fall into the fandom where yes. they are probably celebrities are probably used to people dealing with them and you dealt with him in a different way. Can you speak yeah. to that just a little oh, bit? That's right. I forgot about it was a really interesting moment because and, you know, I've interviewed a few celebrity types like Nora Ephron, but, you know, this was the Bonds. Someone my age, Henry Winkler, is forever. And I've had a few encounters with celebrities, but this was a little different because when I meet most authors, I used to, I don't do it anymore because I like Zoom, but we used to sit in bookstores and set up the cameras. And most authors are not used to sitting down with cameras. It's kind of exciting for them because they're, you know, it's a different, not for Henry Winkler. He's been doing this his whole life. Sure. And I could recognize that. And he just kind of cut off from me. He didn't interact with me. He wasn't glad to see me like I was used to. And so in that, in conjunction with his celebrity, put me off just a little bit. I wasn't interacting with him the way I was used to interacting with authors. But then I sort of thought of Jack. It's sort of the same thing. Celebrity and what they call autistic behavior it becomes similar. In other words, I can't become transfixed by what I'm seeing in front of me. The person has to exist beyond that. Henry Winkler is a person beyond the celebrity, beyond the story I know about him. So I just sort of tried to look beyond what I call that veil that I had put over him and just started addressing the person. And as soon as I did that, it all dropped away. And we had this great conversation, including about Jack, because Henry Winkler's, you know, he's got ADHD and he felt stupid for a long time, interestingly, even though he, all the time he was having all that success, he still felt secretly stupid. He eventually addressed the camera and talked to Jack about it was really moving and and it was it was revelatory to me what I had to learn dealing with a kid my own son on the spectrum was what I could use to deal with a celebrity what I could to see them as a person and not the story I had about them right it That's was great such a great story and just yeah. so useful for life in general yeah yeah in your book bell you talk about following your curiosity for yeah. right yeah. And I'm a huge fan of that too. Can you break it down why it's so essential for a writer to do that and so useful to their yeah. work? Well, because first of all, if you're authentically curious about something, the test is, <laughs> my wife was just reading a quote from Martha Beck, the lovely Martha Beck, who actually blurbed that book eventually for my website, wonderful woman. And her new book's about curiosity. And one of the things she said, this has been on my mind, is that the first question most adults have about a project is, will it sell? And their second question is, will it sell? And the third question is, will it sell? And it's so poisonous to the writer. And I've certainly fallen into that. But the difference is when you have a subject that you're curious about, you don't think about whether it could sell or not or other people like it or not. All you are aware of is that when you rest your attention on it, there is no resistance. It is a magnet for your attention. It doesn't require anything. Because if you're an adult and if you've grown up and gone to traditional schools or worked a job, you have at some point had to make your attention stay on something. Maybe it's your taxes. Maybe it's your partner's story that you've heard before. Maybe it's a book you got to read or whatever. We've all had to put our attention somewhere that we've had to say, no, no, no don't. Just keep it there. We got to do this. We got to do this. Okay, fine. It's part of being an adult. But if you're curious about something, no effort's required. It just wants to rest there and see where it's going. And you will never be better. You will never be more creative, more authentically, naturally creative than when you're actually curious about the thing you're in, you're focused on, the story you're telling. I call it unconditional love for the story. You love it because you love it, not because of what's going to give you, not because of the not because of the success or the money and all that's nice. It's nice. It's nice. But the real joy is I just get to rest my attention on it and I want to find out where it's going. Even by the way, and I think this is really important, Estelle, for personal essays, because that's what I write. Like, that's what I do. And obviously, if it's a personal essay, I tell stories. That's most of what my essays are. Everyone has what it takes has some observations, but there's a lot of stories, right? 
Well, I know what happened. Like, I know what happened. It happened to me. But I don't really know why I'm writing the story until I write it. And when I do write it, I remember stuff I had forgotten. And, and an epiphanies come through. And a lot of the lines in that book were stuff that came to me in that moment as I was writing it. I discovered it. Now, some of it not. I'd been teaching it. So, But a lot of the good stuff, my favorite stuff, is the stuff that came to me at that moment. And that comes from curiosity, saying, I'm so interested in this. I want to see where the story is going. If it's fiction, if it's nonfiction, it doesn't matter. Poetry doesn't matter. I'm just interested. And I'm never more alive. I'm never happier than when I'm doing that. But it's so important for creative people to say, that is enough. That's enough. You don't have to know where it's going. You don't have to know if it's going to sell. Just know that you're interested. Just know that you're interested. And if you can rest in that and know it's enough, it'll take you as far as you need to go. But the, we get into trouble when we think that's not enough. It's not enough. I got to make it. I got to make it better. I got to make it sell to women between the ages of 35 and 50. I got to make sure the opening is and all these other stuff. Right. But really, just make sure you actually give a damn about it. Because I've written whole books that I didn't actually care about. And I didn't sell them because I was like, I think it'll sell. And so I wrote the whole stupid book. And then I was like, you know, and when my agent didn't sell it, I was like, I don't even care. I didn't even care that she didn't sell it because I never cared about the book really right. in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes. And you talk about in your book about present moment. And I think yeah. you mentioned it just now. Yeah. Being in the present moment, the state of flow yeah. Yeah. is where the magic happens. That's right. That's right. And we all, I know that when I'm working on something, and I find this more with essays, of course, and with fiction, like I started writing a novel. Yeah. So being in that present moment, you don't know what's going to come out. You just no. don't know. No. But that feeling of flow, when I find it, and then three hours goes by, right. and, you know, my daughter's text, I look at <laughs> my daughter texted me like, can you pick me up early today? I'm like, yikes, you know, but but the hours have flown and it's just such a magnificent feeling. So what about that flow can you talk about that you talk about in your book, Everyone Has What It Takes? Yeah, and I actually, there's a whole chapter on it in Fearless Writing. Yes. I think the flow state is really important for all creative work and creative writing with it's not science-based. Because yeah, if it's journalistic, then you're dealing with sort of, it's, it's a, it's, you're using a bit more right brain to do it. And that's yes. fine, you know. It's, I've, and I've talked to a lot of journalists who have gone from straight journalism to personal essays or creative writing. I mean, language is language, but it's still, you're in a different state of mind. Yeah. And I think that it's, first of all, you can't be in flow if you're not curious. You have to be curious. Like there, it's not going to happen. And so sometimes I'll be writing and I can tell I'm not in flow. And I'll have to say to myself, are you actually interested in like in this angle you're taking, like you're interested in this subject, I can tell, but maybe you're not actually interested in this angle. Like you're not actually curious about this. Angle. So I got to kind of step back and say, well, what would be the more interesting thing? So you got to be curious. And, you know, I write two essays a week and it's just a blank page. I don't have notes. I almost never have. It's really just, okay, what are we going to, what's it going to be today? And so I have to fish around what just happened. What have I been thinking about? What is interesting to me? So you got to be interested. And fearless writing, the premise of fearless writing is you can't worry about what people think about your stuff. You can't do it. But there's a lot of reasons for writers to think about what people think of their stuff. So that's the premise of the book. The moment, the moment that if you're in flow, the one thing you never think is, I wonder if this is any good. I wonder if other people like it. So as soon as you say, yeah, but what if, you know, what if it's too literary or not literary enough or not, but you're out, you're out as soon as you, you do that. And so you have to be curious. You have to trust in the power of discovery. And I was talking to Paul Harding about this. Paul Harding wrote a, a novel called Tinkers in 2010. So it won the Pulitzer. It was his first novel ever, wins the Pulitzer, then writes another book. Then 10 years go by, I think, and then his third book. And that's when I talked to him. Great conversation. You can look it up on YouTube. Paul Harding, great guy. And we talked about no presumptions. That was the thing he talked about. And we really drilled down. In other words, he's like, this is what writing has taught me. Like never, it's creative writing. Don't presume to know anything about what's coming. Don't, because as soon as you presume, you shut off discovery. And what I have learned, Estelle, and you probably discovering this in fiction writing for sure, but even in the personal essay, it's the thing I didn't anticipate. That's the goal. So even if I write, I write two 400 word essays a week, right? And I usually have an idea, when I do finally get one, I'm like, okay, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll write about that thing, you know, that happened. And I think I know the angle. And I say, okay, so I start it. The first sentence I'm looking for, I've got this thing and, I'm, and I, and I kind of cook, I'm kind of just writing what I know about it. It's a little mechanical, but it's okay. You know, I like writing. 
but I'm looking for that first sentence that I did not anticipate, the one that surprises me, the one that points to something a little different. And then I, ah, now I'm in. Now I've got something. It's the thing I didn't anticipate. That's the goal. That's what I'm always, and in fact, Estelle, I was, used to go for runs and stuff and I would get ideas for blogs or essays. I go, oh, oh I'll do that one. And I learned to say, that, well, don't think you know what this is about, Bill. Go find out, go to the page, and then you'll know, A, if you actually like the idea, and B, if it's even what you think it is. Because sometimes I'll sit down and say, I'm going to write about X. It ends up being about Y. Like the idea of X is just the entry in, and I go in a totally different direction. And I'm like, in fact, the hardest things I've had to write, Estelle, is like when I write something for Writer's Digest where I pitch an idea and they say, okay, I'll say, okay, it's going to be about X, Y, and Z. And then it's got to be about X, Y, and <laughs> yes. Z. And I have to keep it there. And I'm like, oh, this is so hard. I want to just, but I can do it, but it's not the best way for me to write. It's interesting because for me, now that I'm trying to write fiction, being an editor and being a writing teacher and being somebody who's done nonfiction writing, Fiction kind of runs away with you. Oh, and totally I have to let go of the control yeah. that I have as an editor, as a teacher. And it's easy for me writing a personal essay because that's still embodied in me. Now, yeah. fiction is still embodied in me too, but it's different because the character is saying, I want you to write this about me. That's, and I'm like, oh. wait, what? Who are you? Yeah. Oh, that's good. It means you're doing it right. You know, I don't do fiction anymore. I did it for years. It was, it, it, it ended up not being the best ultimate fit for me for whatever reason, this, the creative nonfiction much closer for a lot of reasons, but I, but I learned so much writing fiction. It was that letting go of control. So when I moved over to creative nonfiction, it was easy to just say, well, man, now don't take this wrong, but it's awfully close to fiction. It, when I, it's so close to, yeah. cause you know, look, if I'm writing about something that happened when I was 12, ah, I don't remember most of it, but I remember most of it. I mean, sort of, kind of, but I'm having to sort of reimagine it. The dialogue, oh, yes. I, you know, I got to put dialogue in sometimes. Do I remember what was said? It doesn't, no one does cares. Anyone, not, I mean, really, does anyone? People are like, no. this is verbatim what happened when I was like 10 years old. Oh, okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah, right, nobody, and it's okay. Nobody, I always tell my students, this is a, my students who are doing memoir and personal essay, I'm like, Nobody cares about you. They don't care about, they don't actually care about it. It's okay. They, right. they care about your story, hopefully, but not you. And they don't care about what happened. They don't care what your father actually said. Then nobody cares. They want to be entertained and moved and inspired. So I want to segue to something you said in Fearless Writing, right? Hmm. You talked about the three narrative oh, three yeah. examples of narrative. Yeah. Okay. Three narrative arcs. The three, three narrative, narrative arcs. Yeah. So physical emotional and intentional. Yeah. Now, I teach Vivian Gornick's theory, the situation. Well, I don't know. I don't know. So she talks about the external, which is the situation, which is the physical. Let's say, writing a diary entry from high school. You know, we right. went bowling. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. had ice cream. You know, Mark came. Da, da, da. Right. Then she talks about the story, which is the internal which it could be the implication the emotional implications so it's saying that why what's the so what what's yeah. the underlying emotional implication the threads so i thought it was really interesting how you broke it down into the three narrative arcs can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? yeah so sure and i'll talk about it in terms of creative nonfiction for now though you know obviously it applies it and so yeah. the first arc so it's really the same thing i'm not familiar with her but of course we're all teaching the same thing is the physical arc which is what happened which is, you know, and certainly in memoir, I will call it memoir. Like you got to know where you're starting. You got to know when you're finishing. And when people say, what's your story about? That's usually what they're referring to, although that's never what your story is about. But you got, and, and it's really important. Like that includes everything that's said, everything that's done. Boy meets girl, boy lose girl, boy gets girl back. What's the boy and girl doing? And everybody they talk to, that's the physical arc and you got to know it. But that's like so not important compared to what I call the emotional arc. Because if you have characters and they're doing things, why are they doing it? Why are they doing it? That's everything. It's it's motivation or in fiction for sure. Like where do they start at the beginning and where do they start? At the, like, why does the boy want to be with the girl and why do they lose each other? Like, why aren't they good enough? There's always a problem. There's always some reason they think they're not strong enough, smart enough, pretty enough, whatever. And so that's the emotional arc. Why are they doing what they're doing? Nobody does anything for no reason. I remember Kurt Vonnegut talked about 
your characters have to, you know, he's talking about fiction, have to want something, even if it's a glass of water. Like they've always, you always got to know what they want. And if you don't know what they want, you don't know who they are in a way, right? You got to feel that. So that's the emotional. And I will say in personal essay and memoir, if your listeners write that, the emotional arc is where I spend most of my time because what happens is I will say, okay, I'll say, I know this happened, X happened. And I know I responded this way. Why? I, that's what the emotional arc is. I need to understand on some level why I responded the way I did. What did I believe? What was I worried about? Why was I scared? Why was I happy? Why was something frightening to me? What did I believe could happen? Because that's a me understanding my own motivation. And it's, I have to remember, I always don't understand. So that's the emotional arc. Why are you doing what you're doing? But then I think that the most important arc is what I call the intentional arc, which is why are you telling me this story? What is this story about in, on some level? So boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back might be about self-acceptance. Both have to understand that they're good enough as they are. They don't need the other person to feel good. What is it about? Why are you telling me the story other than you want to get published and you like to write? What is the takeaway? And, in, and I, if I have a career, it's because when I started writing personal essays, I took the ending seriously. I understood that the ending was the most important part. Where am I leaving them? What was this thing about? What is it, is it about? Joy, I don't, and I don't often know intellectually. I just sort of feel the emotional ending of it. It's the but, so what. It's the so what. It's the what. so like, what. I like, why students, tell me this? Right. I tell my students, look at every sentence and ask yourself, so what? If That's it's right. not moving the story forward in some way, you really don't need the sentence. You know, some That's of these right. dialogue tags, good morning, how are right. you? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, <laughs> you know, let's go to the place where you found the body. Oh, okay. Well, that's the interesting part of the story. Let's that's right. <laughs> and yeah, you'd want to do that on a sentence level. And then at the end, if, if I have a disappointment, in, well, I'll be, sometimes I'll be getting essays from, because uh, I do edit author magazine. So I get submissions and I'll say, okay, this is good, especially if it's a story. I'm like, but I won't know until I get to that last paragraph. Do they have a reason for telling me this? Because it's particularly in personal essays. I remember who was it? Wendy, Wendy Lynn Harris wrote a book on writing and selling personal essays. And she just said, look, a personal essay is a story with a lesson. You learned something, something. There's a difference between you at the beginning and you at the end. What is that? Now, maybe you'll spell it out. I tend to do it more obliquely, you know, but there's some sense of a difference between you at the beginning and you at the end. And if there isn't, why are you telling me the story? And it always is a thing you've learned about love, about loss, about acceptance. It's always there because there's always a problem at the center. And usually, and this is interesting, Estelle, we'll get a little deep. If you write personal essay in particular, the resolution is usually not an event, but a perspective. The problem is a thing the resolution is just an awareness. So it's a little, it requires a little finesse to get that ending right. I agree. And I always say, leave leave it with like a gift for the reader. Your ending should be a gift. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Please give yes. me something. There's some transformation that took place yes. from the beginning to the end. It could be in thought, attitude, situation, That's right. emotional arc somewhere. And that is what creates that universal resonance for the reader when they're like, ah, this could happen to me, or I understand this is the transformation. This is what's being left for me. And the other thing I say is to like make it almost like you're looking beyond what where the essay ends. Like, yes, yes, right? yes, yes, absolutely. Because I, 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 I interviewed Cheryl Strayed after she wrote Wild. You know, right after she wrote it, you were, oh, go, you dig. She's wonderful. And yes. we talked about the ending. And she was the first person I heard say this, which was like, look, I didn't have it all figured out when I finished that walk. But the way I framed her description of it, and this is what I say to all my memoir students who'd say, well, I don't have it all figured out. I'm like, yes, yeah, true. But now you are describing how you want to live. From This is the way you want to see things. From, this is the practice from now on. You don't have it all figured out, but you're not going to go back to thinking people are broken anymore. It's not like I never see myself as broken. I still can fall into that fear, you know, that self-doubt. But I can't see the world again the way I did before I had that thought. The change has happened, and now I'm just learning to live from it. And so that, I love that. You're looking beyond the end because that's what you're pointing people towards. 
This is great. This has been such a great discussion. I want to end on a little bit more of a businessy topic. All right, if we I want to talk about gatekeepers because you do talk oh, about them yeah. in your book. Yep, Everyone yep. has what it takes. Yep. In today's age of so many places shutting down, changing, transitioning, people getting buyouts, people changing positions, staff being shut down. Do you feel that there are more gatekeepers or less gatekeepers? And what is your advice on how to navigate that? I think the concept of gatekeepers is one of the things that freaks out most writers. I mean, it's one of the hardest part. And so I would look, I would take a couple couple ways to think about. The first is, of course, now you don't even, you can just circumnavigate them completely if you want. You get your blog going. You know, I should say in in defense of self-publishing. So I'm the editor-in-chief of Author Magazine. And where they built my readership was from my column in that magazine. Well, who's the gatekeeper for that magazine? Me. And so I didn't have to pass anything I wrote by anybody. That freedom really helped me find my voice when I needed to find it. So it was a form of self-publishing. Now we had readers sort of set up because it was through this writing organization. And so I knew people would be reading it. I didn't pass it by anybody. I didn't ask anyone what they thought of it. I just wrote it and I put it up and I wrote it, put it up. And so I do think there is something wonderful, particularly for people who write personal essay type stuff to give yourself a blog where you can just let yourself share your work. But eventually you may want to get paid. <laughs> eventually you may want to reach different people. Or you want to publish a book and yes, you can self-publish books too, but it's boy, it's easier if you have a publisher. You know, they do a lot of stuff for you that you can't do on your own. And so you want to reframe what those people are. And it was Richard Bach. I just, you know, I love Richard Bach. He wrote a book called Jonathan Livingston Seagull back in the 70s. And it sold like 44 million copies. And it's a weird book. It's a weird little book. It's 10,000 words. It's got grainy pictures of seagulls in it. And But it sold like crazy. And he told me this and how it sold is a story in itself. And it's really fascinating. And, but we were talking you about- You can't just leave me hanging now. Okay, I okay, so here's the story. story. So he, he's written a few other books that sort of did whatever. They're you know, obviously not that, but he writes about flying because he's a flying guy. And Jonathan Livingston Seagull is a book about a seagull that wants to perfect flying. Okay, so he sends it out. His agent sends this book out. And he says, the way he described to me is he goes out to his mailbox. This is the 70s, no internet. And there's a there's two pieces of mail. One, a an envelope from his- uh, agent. It's And in it is a letter saying, Richard, I love this book. This is how he told it to me. I love this book. You love this book. Nobody in New York loves this book. It's time to move on. And the other was a piece of mail from, okay, a woman editor in New York, of which there are probably, what, seven in 1970, probably, who also happens to be a pilot. So how many female pilot editors are there? In the one, there has to be one in the world, right? And she says to him, Mr. Bach, I'm a fan of your work. Do you have any projects not currently with anybody else? And he thought, well, indeed I do. So he takes that thing, sticks it back in, sends it to her. And she marches, according to her, down to her editorial meeting and said, did we pass on this book? And they all looked up at her and said, the Seagull book? Yeah, we passed on it. And she said, you're nuts. This book is going to do great. And she told Richard Bach, and he's like, wonderful. She said, how much do you want as an advance? I don't need anything. Just as long as people buy it. She said, we have to give you an advance, Richard, or else they won't publish. Okay, fine, whatever you want. And then boom, it took off. Oh, 44 million wow. copies later. And so, and we were talking about, he said, there's no, he said, you don't want an editor or publisher. You want a member of your intellectual family. And it's really true. You will, when you meet your agent or your they are like friends to you. They they get you, you know, and some of them will just want to make money off of you if they think you're hot and they think you've got, you know, 100,000 followers on Twitter or whatever. And that that relationship is what it is. I think that's fraught. They just see you as a cash cow or they think you don't have enough of a following or whatever. But ideally, they like what you like. They are they believe in what you believe in. You guys can talk the same language. And that's what you're really looking for. The people I've worked with, I get, I'm like, oh, that's right. I, I still remember the time I was published in the New York Times. I sent this piece to it. It was about No One Is Broken. It was called No One Is Broken. And the editor, I was kind of, in, I was like, oh, finally, I'm in the New York Times. A big deal to me, right? She was so respectful. It was 1,500 words. She had to cut it down to 750, which she easily did. <laughs> and she was so respectful because she so loved the piece. I turned her into a gatekeeper, kind of in my mind a little bit, even though she just loved it. And then I saw, oh, that's right. She's just like, 
anybody else. She loves something. She wants to share it. She gets to share it. And so to your listeners, to your viewers, I know you see them like they have all the power, but they are looking for things they love. They have a dream of publishing things that they love. Yeah, they want to make a lot of money, but so do you. You all want them. Everyone wants to make money, but they really would love to share something that they believe in. It's so exciting. Well, you have the same dream. So what you're looking for is people whose dreams overlap. Not, it's just like dating. You don't want to marry anybody. I know you think you do sometimes, but you don't. Just try it. It ain't great. You want to be with a person you love, who interests you, who you can wake up next to and listen to. That's the one you want to be with. And that's who you want to be with as the, you only, you want to find that person who gets it. And then they can open the gate to the readers who get it too. I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy, but that's the truth. That's the truth. Talking about dating, because I was once the dating diva before. I know. But uh, a wise person once told me, marry somebody that you can sit in the silence with. You don't have to be on all the time. That's right. And that is so important yeah and it's sort of like the knowing you know the understanding and i also say to people when they're looking for an agent the agent is not this big kahuna up on mount olympus it's really you want somebody that will handle and does handle the genre that you want to publish in That's because right. otherwise it doesn't matter it's not their interest it's not their focus and you can say you have an agent to the skies it doesn't it, it won't work no you know? well, so, it's absolutely yeah. true absolutely so working I, together you are working together i team. love your whole premise i love how you help writers bill this has been such a fantastic conversation i'm going to put everywhere that people can find you and where they can get your books and i have yeah. your two most recent there they, recent are. Here. there they are and i just so enjoy talking with you every time so thank this has been you so great much. estelle i love talking to other writers who, and i love that we get to talk because you're another essayist like me and a teacher oh it's so much fun to talk to people like it's you. so much fun thank you bill follow me at estellesarasmus.com on my website and on social media which is instagram tiktok and twitter at estelle s erasmus and we're now on youtube for freelance writing direct. Follow along and soon everyone will be reading what you're writing.